Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Sorchik. I'm the Executive Director with Capital Area Healthy Start Coalition. Thank you for joining us today for part two of our Preconception Health of Lunch and Learn series. In our coalition's community needs assessment that was completed in 2020 and our sub subsequent five-year service delivery plan, we recognize that poor preconception health and health inequities are negatively affecting pregnancy and birth outcomes in our community. In our efforts to improve preconception health in women and men locally, our community has come together to provide this series of lunch and learns on topics that are related to improving preconception health. Being healthy before pregnancy can help improve a woman's chances of getting pregnant, and it can help to prevent pregnancy complications when she does get pregnant. Out of 30 cases reviewed by our infant and fetal mortality case review team in 2020, 70% of those mothers were obese or overweight. Being overweight during pregnancy increases a mom's risks of diabetes, high blood pressure, and other conditions that affect the unborn baby, as well as affecting mom's health. In today's presentation, we will learn the importance of good nutrition for a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put those in the chat and we will answer those at the end of present the presentation. So now I would like you all to please join me in welcoming our presenter, Ms. Dykebra Gaskin. Dikebra is the Public Health Nutrition Program Director for WIC and Nutrition at the Florida Department of Health in Leon County. She is a registered and licensed dietitian, certified breastfeeding specialist, and an international board certified lactation consultant. Ms. Gaskin is currently serving as the president of the Florida Breastfeeding Coalition, and she is the co-founder and chair of our local breastfeeding policy work group. Welcome, Dikebra, and thank you for being here with us today. Thank Hi, you so much for the invite. I appreciate the platform, and I appreciate this opportunity. So, and I hope that this presentation is something that you guys can share with friends, information, useful information for friends and family. Um, this is also good information for dads. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to a good time. All right. Thank you. And Chris will be helping me advance my slides. So again, this um, presentation is on um, more of the nutrition part for preconception health. Um, go on ahead. So, um, and this is near and dear to my heart. One of the things I do every day um, outside of the administrative things I do as a director is I do daily consults, nutrition consults with um, pregnant women who um, need some nutrition advice and who are participating in the, in the WIC program. So um, my goals today are just to talk about what preconception nutrition is, um, discuss and understand the scope of what's going on. And Chris gave some stats to kind of, you know, um, bring awareness of the problems, um, discuss adverse pregnancy, outcome, risk, and conditions, um, talk a little bit about food sources of key nutrients that, you know, I discuss and my staff discuss on a daily basis, um, and then talk about some nutrition programs, some resources that can help, and we'll touch a little bit on breastfeeding. Next slide. So um, what is preconception health? Um, the health, the centers of these disease control define um, preconception health as the health of women and men within their childbearing years before they have children. And I love the fact that they include, um, you know, they talk about everyone, not just the folk who are carrying the baby, but other folk who are involved. So, and then the Office of Women's Health, they define it as the health of a woman before she becomes pregnant knowing how health conditions and risk factors can affect a woman or her unborn baby. And that includes knowing which foods, habits, medications, health conditions that can also affect the pregnancy. Next slide. 
So one of the things, and I used to teach nutrition at FAMU, and so we talked about this all the time, about 45% of pregnancies are actually unplanned. And this, this is more recent data in the last couple of years, but the reality is not all are unwanted. So, and this number actually um, continues to, de to decrease. The last time I um, really thought about this and had conversations with the public about it was about um, 10 years ago and the, the number was like 52%. Um, however, a lot of the wanted but unplanned or unintended pregnancies, you still have people who may be at suboptimal nutrition risk, especially through those critical um, first you know, three to five months. And then you also have people who don't have a regular cycle. So um, sometimes pregnancy is actually undetectable until well into the second trimester. So again, you have those critical periods of fetal development that have already passed by the time they realize they actually are pregnant. Next slide. And so just a little bit about critical periods. So remember in pregnancy, each part of the baby's body would actually develop or form at certain times. And then during these times, that's when the body is a little bit more sensitive to actual damage that can be caused by medication, alcohol exposure, um, cigarette smoke, environmental toxins. Um, and so we call these critical periods of development for specific body parts. Next slide. And so this chart is just to show an overview. So if you look, um, you have the period of the ovum, which is the first couple of weeks, but anywhere between like one to eight weeks, excuse me, three to eight weeks are when people um, kind of say, you know, I, I might be pregnant. You get the first chance, the first idea that that cycle's not coming. Um, and usually by week four, when most people have that cycle, which is approximately 20, 26 to 28 days, they realize, hmm, I'm not you know, seeing anything. And then they usually confirm like week five to six. Well, what's going on by week six? And if you look, you have the brain, spinal cord, central nervous system, uh, that development is well underway. You have um, heart structures, you have arm and leg buds, you have ear buds, you have um, eye buds, eye spots already developing. And so those are um, the beginnings you're leading into a critical period. And then, so all of that is going on and there may be some suboptimal nutrition. Um, and so that highlights the importance of this talk um, about where nutrition plays a role. Next slide. So thinking about preconception nutrition status and adverse pregnancy outcome risk. So we know BMI and nutrition status can affect pregnancy outcomes. Um, and I can talk about how it affects fertility, but that's for, for another lecture. Um, birth defects, low birth weight, and we're gonna talk about that a lot preterm delivery, um, maternal complications such as gestational diabetes or um, gestational hypertension, and then the need for emergency or operative birth. Next slide. So thinking about nutrient deficiencies preconception, um, preconceptionally, um, according to NHANES, which is the Na National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, um, the most common nutrient deficiency is um, of those of childbearing age are, is iron, okay? And a lot of people say, hey, I have anemia, I have iron problems, I had them all my life. And I always tell people, well, if you think you may want to have a baby um, before you get pregnant, it's the time to get that addressed. Also, you have um, low vitamin D. 42% of non-Hispanic um, Black women have low vitamin D. 4.2% um, of, of non-Hispanic white women. And I have to look at that because that doesn't feel right to me. Um, but overall, women of childbearing age um, have low vitamin D. Okay. Um, and then you have folic acid, which we know folic acid as a B vitamin is important to preventing birth defects. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. 81% um, of non-Hispanic Black women are not getting enough folic acid and the um, RDA is 400 micrograms. And then you have 79% of Hispanic women and you have 60% of non-Hispanic white women. Next slide. I'm also going to touch on some other nutrients of concern. Um, I talk a lot about 
people not getting enough calcium in their diet. It's a question I ask all the time. Um, actually, underhydration, um, dehydration um, is also a very big problem um, during pregnancy. And then we'll talk about protein. And I'm going to touch a little bit about um, obviously getting too much of the wrong things, too much sugary beverages, um, high fat, um, deep fried fat foods, and then refined starches. Next slide. So with pre-pregnancy obesity, this has been a growing public health concern in the last 10 years. Um, it's something that's been tracked really for the last 25, but we've, we continue to see an increase despite all of the um, public health um, movement, um, PSAs about trying to eat healthy and um, you know, reduce weight, try to move to a healthier weight. Since 2013 to 2018, we actually have seen an increase in obesity across all racial and ethnic groups um, of women of childbearing age. And then that increase is actually concurrent with the increase that we've seen of obesity related, um, the obesity related burden of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So along with the increase in obesity, we have seen more preterm delivery, more low birth weight, more gestational diabetes, and more pregnancy-associated hypertension. Next slide. Um, so this, um, this chart actually comes from the Centers of Dis Disease Control and Prevention, um, but basically you can see um, the percentage of babies born preterm, and this is looking at race and ethnicity um, between 1993 and 2017. So there is a break with this, with this graph, and that break is not a sudden decrease. They actually change how they measure or define um, prematurity. Um, so you, that's just what that break means. But as you can see, non-Hispanic non -Hispanic Black women have the highest um, preterm delivery percentage. Um, and then you see um, there's a, I don't know if you can see the color, but that thick Black line is all races and ethnicities. And it's a little bit over 10%. That has decreased slightly to just under 10% as of 2020. It's like 9.2. Um, but it's, so that's about one in 10 babies. Next slide. And this is something that people don't really take into account, um, but it does have value. This actually talks about per, the percentage of babies who are born full term, but are low birth weight. And remember, low birth weight is considered um, being born at five pounds, eight ounces or less. And so we have babies going all the way to 38, 39 weeks, 40 weeks, but they're still considered low birth weight. So you have to ask questions, what's going on? And when I, when I um, talk to my new moms and I say, okay, how much did you, your baby weigh? How many weeks did you deliver? And I am seeing a lot more low birth weight babies being born um, 35, 36 weeks um, and later full term. And they're a lot smaller than I'd like them to see. So this is definitely something that's been um, concerning for me and a little bit alarming. Next slide. So shifting on to these conditions, um, gestational diabetes, a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, and it's basically um, when you have high blood sugar um, during pregnancy. And so that is, um, we say it's recognized during pregnancy. Yeah, this person may have been a diabetic, but didn't know, unfortunately, because of, we have a lot of people who are uninsured or un, underinsured, um, there's not a lot of pre-pregnancy monitoring. So they may have already been a diabetic or pre-diabetes. And what happens is when you're pregnant, you actually have a little bit of a natural insulin resistance. Um, and that occurs because you're shifting glucose over to the baby. Um, however, normally most people can um, punch out a little bit more insulin to bring that blood sugar down and get that blood glucose in a normal range. Um, you know, 
within two hours or every few hours of consuming food. But when that mother cannot get enough insulin produced, that means that she's greatly in, um, insulin insensitive and her body's not responding to it. So you are not having glucose um, reduced in the presence of insulin and it just pools in the blood. It's checked when she goes to her um, 27, 28 week um, you know, get those labs done. And sure enough, the blood sugar is, is pretty high. So this is how we define um, diabetes. Next slide. Gestational hypertension, um, and this term isn't used all the time, um, but it's basically high blood pressure during pregnancy. And again, because sometimes there's not a lot of pre-pregnancy monitoring, she may have already been hypertensive or borderline, um, but now you have a growing baby, you have a higher blood volume to support the pregnancy, and you see um, blood pressure issues um, arise and it's a risk. So we know that it affects one in 10 pregnancies. Um, there are some serious risks, including preterm delivery and low birth weight, um, to name two of several. Um, the risk to the mother is preeclampsia, eclampsia, stroke, the need for induction or surgical intervention. Um, and you can even have placental abrupt abruption. Um, and there's three types. We you, you hear you usually hear terms like preeclampsia, but we also consider preexisting. Some people do enter their pregnancy having already been diagnosed with um, hypertension and um, pregnancy induced. Um, just the the fact that they were pregnant, it caused their blood pressure to go up, and it just can't naturally come down. And so pre-existing high blood pressure should be well controlled before um, conception, okay? Next slide. So I'm going to shift a little bit and we're going to get to the fun part talking about food. Um, I'm in this business because I love food. I love to eat, but I do recognize food um, and nutrition and, and nutrients um, can play a key role into um, improving health, moving us from suboptimal to optimal nutrition um, conditions. Next slide. So let's talk about iron deficiency anemia. Um, so it is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. And half of that, 50% of that, is due to just not consuming enough um, iron in the diet. And globally, um, unlike the United States, and we do have hunger issues in the United States, and we're going to address that, um, globally, you do have a lot worse um, you have other more situations where people don't have access to food. So that would make sense that just not having access to food would make a person iron deficient going into a pregnancy or just nutrient deficient going into a pregnancy. However, in the United States where we do have access to food generally, um, it's more of the type of foods we choose to eat. OK, so about 52 percent of pregnancies are actually the the mother is deficient or low in iron. Um, and so remember, during pregnancy, you have the 20 or 30 pounds that of weight that they encourage you to gain. Well, five pounds of that is just more blood. So when you have more blood and circulating, you need more iron circulating to keep your iron levels up and to support the health of the pregnancy and to make sure um, that mother doesn't become fall into an anemic status. So, um, so we know that iron, it plays a role in fetal development, especially the neurological system, the brain development. And again, remember in, um, the, the slide I showed you with the picture, uh, by the time one realizes that they actually are pregnant, you already have central nervous system, heart structures, brain structures, the formation is already underway. So um, before you get to that critical period, you wanna make sure that iron levels are adequate. Um, so, and then it's also important for red blood cell development um, as the baby develops. Next slide. So iron deficiency anemia, mild anemia is associated with fatigue, headaches, and dizziness. And pregnancy alone can make you tired, can have you having headaches. So when you're anemic, it actually 
um, makes these, these symptoms exacerbated. Okay. And so that mother is weak, that person feels tired. Um, and then as the baby grows, um, you feel even more weak. So it's important to, to address this as soon as you can. Then you have severe anemia. Okay. And we see this all the time. Sometimes I'll have someone come in. We, we at WIC, we monitor hemoglobin. We haven't done it because, much because of the pandemic, but we would have moms come in and sometimes their hemoglobin is a six or a seven. We send them immediately to their doctor, to the ER, because that can, that's a sign that this mom and this baby is some distress. And she didn't know she was in distress, but we bring that to attention and say, this is something that needs to be addressed. This is very dangerous. Okay, but severe anemia, um, prolonged severe anemia can mean premature labor, um, intrauterine growth restriction, something called IUGR, low birth weight, birth asphyxia, and then neonatal anemia, the baby's born and the baby's found to be severely anemic. And that definitely will guarantee that baby some time in the NICU. So that delays the discharge as to when mom and baby can begin or the family can begin to bond with that baby. And then again, it can affect critical periods of fetal development. Next slide. So where is iron in the human diet? So we actually split how we get iron into two categories. We have what's called heme iron and non-heme iron. And for people who eat meat, um, it's the easiest way to get iron. Iron in meat is uh, very absorbable. So things like liver, um, I'm not a big fan of liver. My mother, she loved to eat liver and onions. Um, but for people who don't eat liver, which is a great source of iron, if you like to eat red meat, beef, um, always choose, choose lean choices, um, chicken, ham, fish, mussels, sardines, um, eggs are good um, animal sources. And again, they're quite absorbable. But for people who don't or cannot eat enough meat or eat meat at all, you have plant sources, okay? So things like broccoli, any kind of green leafy vegetable, kale, spinach, um, they're great sources. If you like to eat um, beans, um, lentils, apricots, pumpkin seeds, um, a lot of cereals are fortified with iron. And, and of course, you have your, um, your multivitamin or your iron supplement that you might have been prescribed. So you have these plant-based sources. However, they're not absorbed as well. So what we tell people is when you're consuming these, make sure you consume something with vitamin C at that meal. So some of this um, involves a little intentionality. You have to be intentional um, and thinking about it. And this is being proactive. So when you know you're having some vegetables, um, consume some apple juice or orange juice with that meal or have some fruit as dessert, something like strawberries, which is really, really rich in vitamin C, would make a good complement to your vegetables to help you absorb more iron. Um, in contrast to that, I do tell my clients, definitely don't drink tea and don't drink milk when you're consuming um, foods with iron because excess calcium actually prevents iron absorption. And it has more to do with um, calcium and iron when they're absorbed, they actually are carried on the same carrier protein. But calcium for some reason always wins the day and iron actually isn't well absorbed. So you wanna do calcium at a different time that you're eating an iron rich food. Um, and then with tea, um, the tannins that make the tea brown actually prevent iron absorption. We don't know exactly why this happens, but people who drink a lot of tea actually have really poor iron absorption. And a lot of times when we check our iron, it's, it's always borderline or low. So those are just some tips to make sure if you're consuming all this food with iron, you're not kind of um, counteracting your hard work and not actually absorbing the iron. So keep that in mind. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about calcium um, and vitamin D. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart because when I was in grad school, I actually studied lactose mild digestion. Um, and it's something I actually suffer from. I have like some mild lactose intolerance. Um, so with calcium, it's really important. Um, it plays a role in fetal bone and teeth development. 
a lot of people don't realize a baby actually forms both sets of teeth, the beginnings of both sets of teeth in utero. So by the time your baby's born, those tiny little teeth buds are, they haven't erupted, but they're present. So the importance, the presence of calcium in the diet is very, very important to fetal development. So, and believe it or not, while we do most of our iron, like 99% of our, um, excuse me, 99% of our calcium is sequestered in our bones and teeth. And that 1% is actually in the blood for the purposes of cardiac heart health. Um, so it's involved with fetal heart development, um, muscle development, and nerve development. Okay. So, and we know that having enough calcium and vitamin D in the diet, you have a lower risk of, again, pregnancy associated, high blood pressure, or hypertension. Okay. And it also reduces the long-term risk of bone mineral deficits, such as osteoporosis later in life. And what that means is every time one carries a baby, every time a woman carries a baby, um, she has to make her baby's entire skeleton. And I like to bring that up. I say, listen, you're carrying this baby. You're making your baby's entire skeleton. And then when we do the um, nutrition questionnaire, I say, well, how much milk do you drink? And they say, oh, I don't drink, I don't drink milk at all. I haven't drank that in years. You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't drink that. And I said, okay, how are you getting calcium in your diet? Then it's crickets. And so I like to have that conversation because again, I have to raise awareness and get them to understand and think about, wait, I haven't been getting calcium in my diet. So where is the calcium coming from to make my baby's bones and teeth? It has to come from somewhere. And believe it or not, it's actually the maternal skeleton, um, the maternal skeleton, mom's bones and teeth are being sacrificed for that purpose. And every time you have a baby and you're not consuming enough calcium, that sacrifice can cause osteoporosis by the time you hit your 40s. And that's when you're out of childbearing age, okay? So when I think about my clients, a lot of my clients, um, some of them only have one child. Some of my clients have 10. Some of my clients have 10 children that they've birthed naturally, they've birthed some C-section, and they carry them full term. So we have a population of, of people who do have a lot of children, but again, that nutritional risk is a sacrifice to herself if she's not consuming enough calcium um, before she got pregnant, between pregnancies and during her pregnancy. So I hope I'm getting the message that this is really important. And the last thing I wanted to bring up about calcium and vitamin D, we recommend um, people actually space their pregnancies. And that's not for like social reasons, okay? There's a lot of reasons to space your pregnancies, but it actually takes 12 to 18 months to really recover from a pregnancy. So a lot of that bone loss that occurred um, during pregnancy, it takes about a year to recover some of that, most of that, okay? So if you're pregnant, which we do see a lot within six weeks of the last pregnancy, within six months, you haven't really come back to pre-pregnancy nutritional stores. And now we're sacrificing more for the next baby. And that's life, life happens. But I, again, I hope I'm highlighting the importance um, of why we have to think about the nutrition component. Next slide. So vitamin D, um, this is associated with a positive and protective effect on the fetal genome. And I love vitamin D. Um, I could talk about vitamin D all day. It's really one of the most interesting nutrients I've ever studied. Um, so it actually, in addition to being a vitamin, it actually um, is like an immunomodulator. And so it actually can um, not so much control genes, but it plays a role in, you know, genes doing the different things that they need to do. And it also acts as a hormone. So we know that hormones send messages. And so it actually can send messages and part of its hormonal um, properties is how it works with calcium for bone health. Okay, but we know um, not enough vitamin D is also associated with preeclampsia, and that has to do with hypertension, um, abnormal placental development, 
um, at the transcription, excuse me, at the transcription level. And again, that's because of um, vitamin D's um, ability to influence the fetal genome and um, gene transcription. So what you happen is you don't have that full vascularization of the placenta and we need those um, blood vessels to be working good. We need them to be formed good because the blood vessels is where um, blood flows. And that's where the nutrients flow. So that baby can get all of the nutrition that it can. But if that placenta is not, you know, formed very well, not doing what it's supposed to do, then you won't have a baby that's thriving. You won't have a pregnancy that's working right. And that can negatively affect blood pressure as well. And then um, it also plays a role in anti-inflammatory immune responses. I'm looking at some of the questions. Okay. There was a question about the findings. Chris, did you want me to wait until the end or answer that one now? That's up to you. If you want to answer now, that's okay. Okay. Um, that looked like a really good question by um, Dr. Close. Can you address the finding that vitamin D deficiency has been on the rise um, since the pandemic. Um, Dr. Close, I'm not really familiar with um, that particular finding. What I suspect is that we've had a lot of um, food insecurity. We've had food insecurity and hunger on the rise. And um, I'm gonna get into food sources in a second. A lot of those food sources are not available or they have been absolutely out of reach for many, many Americans, probably worldwide. Um, so, but I'm not exactly, I haven't read that study, but I'm not really surprised at all that this is something that's happened. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk and you can do the next slide, Chris. I wanted to do this talk to highlight um, the fact that life can, has continued to happen. We've had a pandemic, but the babies are still being born. So we wanna, it's really important that we really look at this closely and have these conversations. Um, so, and when I think about, absolutely, when I think about these food sources, where do we get, where do we get calcium? So most of us um, drink um, regular cow's milk. I drink lactose-free milk or I'll drink like soy milk or coconut milk or something like that. But the easiest way to get calcium historically has been milk for people who drink it. And the recommendation is, um, the recommendation is three servings a day if you do like milk, yogurt, and cheese, any combination of that. And then you have milk alternatives like your soy milk, your almond milk. And um, depending on how they're fortified, like certain almond milks on the market, you only need two servings to get the RDA. Um, and then you also have dark green leafy vegetables um, like spinach, broccoli, collards, and kale. You have to eat quite a bit of it. I can eat green leafy vegetables all day. I love them. Um, but then again, um, you know, when I'm doing that, I just kind of default to drinking something with vitamin C. And then you have okra, you know, beans, um, a lot of your um, sardines, um, canned salmon, um, you get some calcium from there. And I'm just like, I'm, a, I'm Southern. Like if I eat canned salmon, I'll make a croquette. I'm eating the bones too. That's where the calcium is. I'm just, you know, I love to eat seafood. And then fortified orange juice. A lot of people think that orange juice is a natural source of calcium and vitamin D is not. But um, for people like my husband has a milk allergy, so he'll drink some fortified orange juice. I'm very intentional about buying orange juice that's fortified. So you have to check the label. Um, and then um, I was born in the 80s. So cod liver oil, I used to get a teaspoon a day of cod liver oil and you get a little, um, you get some vitamin D from that actually. Um, there was a question before we move to the next slide about calcium supplements, if I saw that right. Um, I do recommend calcium and vitamin D supplement, um, not single dose. I, if you're calcium deficient as far as your diet, I do recommend a combination supplement of calcium and vitamin D. If you're not calcium deficient um, and you drink plenty of, you consume plenty of calcium rich foods, I do recommend a vitamin D supplement. Most people are deficient, so I do recommend that. 
all the time, you really need to talk to your, um, your OB, your primary doctor about the supplements um, that you, you may or may not need to take. But this is something that should be in the, your conversation with your OB. When you learn that you're pregnant, you should be saying, hey, I eat this. I don't like this. I, you know, milk makes me sick. How do I make sure I get some calcium? Okay. Um, and of course, always talk to a registered dietitian. Next slide. So shifting over to protein intake, this is something that I don't think people um, take as seriously as we need to. The placenta really does require enough um, amino acids, which is what those are the basic components of proteins. Um, the placenta requires enough amino acids for the baby to grow and develop properly, okay? Um, and low protein is actually associated with embryonic loss, intrauterine growth restriction. Again, we have a baby not getting up, not growing um, to the, not growing as they should. So what that looks like is let's say you get monitored and you're 30 weeks and they may say, hey, this baby's measuring 27 weeks or something like that. That's a growth restriction. Good prenatal care can catch that and counteract that, but sometimes um, some people don't get good prenatal care. Um, and sometimes we do need to look at the diet. Reduce postnatal growth due to amino acid deficiency. So a lot of babies who are born with, um, who have IUGR, they may be slightly smaller and they actually have seen that up to age three. And then it can actually affect fetal programming and alters gene expression. And what we suspect, what the research suspects is um, that reduced postnatal growth has something to do with not getting enough protein. And so with the DNA, it's not transcribing enough protein to support growth. And that's why we talk about what's going on prenatally, what's going on before you conceive can actually affect your child through their childhood. Next slide. So where do we get protein, um, which are your essential amino acids? Um, meat is an easy way to get it. Everyone doesn't eat meat. So I always love to promote plant proteins, um, beans and rice. When you eat them together, um, they actually make a complete protein. Um, eggs are a good protein. If you like eggs, it's actually 96% absorbable um, like meat. So you're not losing a lot of that. Um, and protein is also good because these foods provide um, the essential amino acids, minerals like iron, some of them have calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and you get a lot of healthy fats. So proteins play a really, really important role in the, in the diet. Lastly, about protein, we want to make sure you're doing lean protein whenever you can. Um, and then, of course, you want to do baked or grilled over fried. I have some friends who love their air fryer um, and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread. So if you have access, you have an air fryer, it's a good investment um, to, you know, you get a different product, but you're not getting, you don't have to add breading. You don't have to add a lot of fat and that keeps the saturated fat um, out of the diet. Next slide. Okay, so shifting over to folic acid. So this is a big one. Folic acid, there's been so much public health movement about folic acid. We know that it's important for fetal development. Um, for those who don't know, it is a B vitamin. We, it's um, actually um, vitamin B9. And it's important with DNA and helping the body make new red blood cells. Um, and so we know that it's associated with um, the prevention of neural tube defects, um, spina bifida and encephaly are um, two of the bigger ones among other types of um, neural tube defects. Um, and so there's some research that talks about it can help prevent very early pregnancy losses. And the recommendation is 400 micrograms. Some people do need to have up to 800 micrograms, but that's something that you need to discuss about your doctor if that's appropriate. There are some genetic components associated with um, early pregnancy losses that I, I didn't put that in the slide, but I do work with um, some women who have genetic concerns related to folic acid. And so they have to have a different type of treatment. But again, that is the importance of preconception, health monitoring, going to the doctor regularly, 
trying to figure out where your health risks are. And for some people, there's something going on with folic acid that has to be addressed. And so at a basic level, just good nutrition, including that in your diet, taking a multivitamin or a prenatal vitamin with folic acid will help to reduce that risk. Next slide. Someone asked in the chat, how soon should you take, how early should you take prenatal vitamins? Um, because of those very first few slides that I talk about, because you don't know when you can get pregnant, especially if you're sexually active, if you're of childbearing age and if you're sexually active, you should take a prenatal vitamin or a multivitamin with folic acid. And that's my recommendation. So why is folic acid in, um, important during pregnancy? So I hinted on that a lot with red blood cell development. It's associated with um, how DNA works. Um, and then if you look at this graphic, you can see in the earliest part of fetal development, okay, you have that neural tube that has to close at the top and the bottom. So when you have incomplete closure, that's where you have possibly the spine um, forming outside of the baby's body, or you may have um, some kind of deficit with development with the brain. Um, and then you have complete closure. Um, and so we've seen a decrease in the last, I would say, 20 something years. And if you go to the next slide, I think it addresses this. Okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we, um, folic acid, in addition to being found in dark green leafy vegetables, um, a lot of citrus fruits, even orange juice, have folic acids. Um, whole grains. I, I didn't even realize when I first started studying folic acid in school, but then I learned that beef liver um, has folic acid in it for those who like liver. Um, but the United States, because this was a problem, so the United States actually started a fortification program um, of all of the flour. So pretty much all of the, um, the flour in the United States, the breads, the cereals that you buy are fortified with folic acid. And believe it or not, within a few years, they actually saw a decrease in neural tube defects. So it actually works. They don't know the mechanism as to what exactly folic acid is doing um, to, to reduce or prevent that um, neural tube from staying open. But there's a relationship because they were able to really, really track a, like a significant decrease Increase in neural tube defects. So we know that it definitely works. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to touch on water because water intake is really, really important. Um, water, believe it or not, in addition to carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals, it is listed as a nutrient. Our body needs water. Um, we know it's helpful for, for digestion. It helps pass nutrients from the placenta to the baby. Um, water is part of the amniotic fluid, okay? Um, and pregnant people need to have eight to 12 cups. There's some research that says eight to 10 cups, but eight to 12 cups of water every day during your pregnancy. And that's a lot of water, especially when, you, when your bladder can only have so much, okay? Next slide. Um, so one of the things I wanted, the reason why I wanted to bring up water is because again, I do these nutrition consults and a lot of my clients, they say, oh, I'm not drinking a lot of water or they're drinking a lot of everything else, a lot of soda, a lot of juice. And they say, oh, I get water from my juice, um, but you're getting a lot of sugar as well. Um, some of them are drinking a lot, of, a lot of coffee or soda and coffee, a lot of like caffeine can act as a diuretic. So you're actually, your urine output is a little bit higher than it normally would be. Um, and uh, the biggest thing with water, it is habit related. If you're not really big of a water drinker before you're you're pregnant, it doesn't automatically click for a lot of people to start drinking more water during their pregnancy, or they just find it incredibly hard to make it a habit. So my, my um, take home from this is to make sure if you want to have a baby, be a water drinker, okay? Um, I have people who will have their they'll have their water bottle and then they put fruit in it. I think that's lovely. Um, cucumber slices, um, whatever you have to do to make it taste, taste good. I prefer, prefer my water room temperature. I don't like cold water. 
Um, but however you can get water in your diet, get um, in your everyday diet, get plenty of water. And one of the things, especially because we're heading into the warmer months, one of the things my clients suffer from is underhydration or dehydration. Okay, um, they're not drinking enough water, especially in those early that early part of the pregnancy, the first trimester where there's a lot of vomiting. That vomiting, um, sometimes there's a lot of diarrhea as part of the pregnancy you're losing electrolytes. So when they report that to me, I do tell them to do a little bit of Gatorade, do some Powerade or some kind of electrolyte replacement so that they're not in the hospital. Unfortunately, that message doesn't get through and they're in the hospital with an IV drip. So again, making sure they're drinking plain water, I do encourage that. I do encourage um, electrolytes as needed. Okay, we talk a, lo a lot about how do you know you're, you're under hydrated or dehydrated. I say if you feel incredibly thirsty, you're already mildly clinically dehydrated. So to listen to your body. Um, and just again, as you move into that second and third trimester, that baby's now two, three, four, five pounds, they're pushing down on that, that bladder or you know urine output, it just increases. Um, and that's just a part of pregnancy. So being highly aware of that, it's just important to consume enough water on a daily basis. Next slide. So just a couple of things. Um, this is just some evidence. Um, so uh, this paper um, came out, I want to say in 2019. So it talks about a diet rich in vegetables and fish um, was shown to reduce the risk of high blood pressure during pregnancy. And so um, they just wanted to see the, the examiners wanted to see the association between um, mid-pregnancy diet patterns um, and then pregnancy associated hypertension. And this was a big study. Um, with over 55,000 Danish women. And I know they say, oh, you guys, you're talking about Danish women. Maybe you should talk about American women, but we're all humans, okay? And there are some conditions that are slightly different in, in, um, in where Danish women live, but we're all human. So, so, so this definitely applies. Overall, they looked at, they did a food frequency questionnaire, they looked at their diet, and they kind of split the diet patterns into seven eating styles or diet, diet patterns. And basically what they found is that um, women, pregnant women who adhere consistently to more of a Western diet, um, which is a diet high in refined grains, um, mixed or fried foods, meats, potatoes, margarine, they had a higher um, odds of developing gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. But women whose diet fell into a pattern that was close to the Mediterranean style diet, minus the wine, um, but they had more fish. And we're not talking about eating fish every day, um, just eating, you know, up to twice a week. Um, they had an inverse relationship with the odds of developing gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. So, um, and we're talking about four or five servings of vegetables every day. Um, so again, and remember vegetables are, we talked about vegetables have calcium, they have um, iron, there is vitamins and minerals in vegetables. So you're, so that baby's getting that all the time. And then fish um, has vitamin D, it has protein. So these babies are getting um, a higher quality diet in development. The placenta is healthier. So you don't see these um, adverse signs um, of, of gestational um, hypertension. Next slide. Um, this is another study. Um, it talked about pre-pregnancy adherence to dietary patterns um, and lower and, and a lower risk of gestational diabetes. Okay, and so the aim of this study was to look at usual pre-pregnancy adherence to well-known dietary patterns and the risk of gestational diabetes. So um, it already showed that research has already shown that adherence to certain healthful dietary patterns can reduce um, pregnancy-associated hypertension. So looking at 21,000 singleton, not twin births or triplet births, singleton births, this was done in the United States. There were no prior chronic disease or previous diagnoses of, of diabetes. Okay, so 871 of the 21,000 women did develop 
gestational diabetes. Um, and then just looking at the three helpful diet patterns that they were kind of focusing on, people who adhere to the, the, more, the more helpful diet patterns um, had the lowest risk of gestational diabetes. So the diet patterns they focused on was something called the DASH diet, which is probably the only diet your doctor will ever tell you to do. Um, and I'll, I'll get to what that looks like. And then something called the uh, alternate Mediterranean diet minus the wine, and then the alternate um, healthy eating intakes. And the, um, those last two are just kind of like a scoring pattern. Next slide. I love, love, love the DASH diet. I studied it in school. Um, it's basically, if, you, if you're not familiar with the DASH diet, um, they presented the results in 1998. I think it was the New England Journal of Medicine. They talked about this diet pattern where they gave people this diet. Um, awesome, Dr. Close. Um, they, they put people on this diet, which was basically high in fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy, um, polyunsaturated fats, lean protein, nothing fried, reduction of sweets, not omission. And they were not trying to get the participants to lose weight. They just said, what will happen if we give them this food, um, this diet pattern, and they saw a reduction in hypertension. They saw a reduction of people who were on hypertension medicine. Some of them came off and some of them lowered the, um, their dose um, significantly. So it's a really, really, really good diet. And again, it's not a weight loss diet. And it highlights the fact that food can actually help to prevent or treat chronic conditions which is absolutely amazing. Um, and then you had the scoring system of where they looked at um, people who fell with more of a Mediterranean style diet. So lots of monounsaturated um, fats, polyunsaturated fats. Um, and then you had the healthy eating index. Um, we can move on to the next slide. We're kind of running out of time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna push through a little bit. So you can go to the next slide. So these next few slides were just about some programs that can help. Um, Healthy Start is a really, really good program. This is something you can enroll in as soon as you learn you're in pregnancy. There's a screening process. And as you, if you go to their website, you can see all of the resources available. There's home visits, which is absolutely amazing. Prenatal support, prenatal education. A lot of the Healthy Start coalitions are doing some breastfeeding support. Um, and they do, if you go to the next slide, they do referrals. If, you know, some people can't get the kind of services that they need, um, they have a referral system, a connect system where you can get pointed in, in the right direction. Next slide. Um, and then you have WIC, which is my program, the special supplemental program um, for women, infants, and children. You get um, nutrition counseling advice, healthy foods um, during the pregnancy. One thing that's unique about WIC is women who miscarry can be eligible for benefits within the first six months of the event. So that's something sometimes our prenatal clients do have a, have a loss. And so we actually encourage them to re-enroll so we can give them some nutritional support and food for the next six months. Um, that's something that people are, are not aware of. And oftentimes she does conceive and she's back into a pregnancy status, which is good because we gave her nutritional advice between that time. Um, next slide. Um, you can just kind of go through that. WIC is just, go on to the next slide too. WIC has been proven, it's been well-researched. Um, there's been studies that show that women who are enrolled in WIG have lower risk of low birth weight, very low birth weight versus, versus women who are similar, same socioeconomic status, but not participating in WIG. Okay. Um, there's a significant decrease in Medicaid expenditures in the first postpartum years. These, these babies who are participating in WIC are less sick. You can go to the next slide. Um, and you can go through these slides. These are just the foods that we provide, low fat dairy, um, lactose free milk, soy milk is available, cheese and yogurt, next slide. Fruits and vegetables, eggs, cereal. We do um, grain products where they're all whole grains, next slide. 
fruits and vegetables, organic is allowed um, for our exclusively breastfeeding moms, or if she's pregnant carrying twins, um, breastfeeding twins, um, she can get canned fish, which always goes over well, or canned salmon, sardines. Um, and then we do formula for babies who need formula, um, baby foods for babies. Next slide. Next slide. Um, this slide is important because we do provide medical nutrition supplements. Ever so often, I may have a pregnant mom who um, has a serious medical condition. Some of them have severe hyperemesis gravidarum. Um, I've seen people lose as much as 30 pounds, 40 pounds within their pregnancy. Um, and so they do need some extra nutritional support. That's something WIC is prepared to do. We have children who have serious conditions, tube fed. Um, paraplegic. Um, and so we're, we do some nutritional support um, that looks like a, a supplement. Next slide. We have our breastfeeding program, definitely encourage breastfeeding. Next slide. I'm sorry, I'm going through these pretty quickly. Um, we have a breast pump loan program. We do one-on-ones. We're helping moms with latches. We've been doing that since um, last June. So it's going on a year um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, because we're, you know, a lot of moms were wanting, are wanting to breastfeed versus formula feed just with the pandemic. They want that immune um, protection for their baby. So we, we've been providing those services. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. And then just SNAP benefits. We encourage moms to supplement their diet um, and apply for the SNAP program, also known as the food stamp program. Um, and so Again, SNAP benefits can be used at your local farmer's markets here in, in Leon County, which is absolutely amazing. Some farmer's markets will double up to $40. So they give you $40 worth of fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables for just $20. Okay, next slide. And then farm share, um, they give, they actually have a three farm share drops today, but you can go to this website and you can have access to fresh foods, locally grown, healthy, high quality foods. I've seen things like almond milk um, at the farm share, um, just really, really great delicious food. And they give some nutritional um, advice, not advice, but um, information as well. So definitely point people who are food insecure to the WIC program, Healthy Start, Farm Share, encourage them to apply for SNAP benefits because it's that important. Next slide. So just finally, before conception, if you just think, like, I think I might want to have a baby, be healthy, be intentional. If you're sexually active, you know, you have to be careful with alcohol intake. Um, some people are recreational drug users. I hate to say it. So all of that really, really needs to be addressed because Pregnancy can occur if you're sexually active, okay? If you have other chronic conditions like hypertension or diabetes, that really needs to get well controlled. Ideally, people will be more diet and health lifestyle control versus having to do medications. But your doctor can put you on a safe medication for pregnancy or breastfeeding, believe it or not. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> So during pregnancy, prenatal care, talking to your OB, your midwife and nutritionist, getting baseline labs, taking your diet and nutrition seriously um, is very important. Get resources, get help, you know, work with a doula, other birth workers, lactation support, and definitely enjoy your, your pregnancy. Next slide. Next slide. And that's it. I've taken up a lot of your time. I really appreciate your time. And Hippocrates, this quote is associated with Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. And hopefully I've given you guys some great tips and information that you can take home and share with friends and family. Thank you so much for your time. Someone asked me, has WIC enrollment decreased? Um, it's decreased only because we're short staff. Um, we have a lot of inquiries and people wanting to participate in the WIC program because of the food insecurity and what's going on with, with unemployment. So we definitely, we are quite busy here at WIC. You're welcome. Simone, are there any other questions in the chat or does anybody wanna come off mute and ask any questions? 
there's a question about reaching out about lactation services. You just need to call our main number. That number is 850-404-6350. Um, there's a few comments as well. Um, there are some UK studies linking vitamin D deficiencies with the risk of COVID. Um, someone also said we have a faculty member that conducted research on mercury levels in fish that had an adverse effect on pregnant women. Um, so to the first one about vitamin D and COVID, COVID does affect, we, COVID is a, still a big question mark um, because especially people with long-term COVID symptoms, like the results, like long haulers conditions, it's a big question mark. It does not surprise me that um, people who have had problems, who had COVID, may have had long haulers, still have some deleterious effects related to COVID. And if they're getting their vitamin D looked at, I, I'm not surprised that um, that could be affected. Um, but COVID continues to be a huge question mark. I am going to be following the research. Um, a lot of my clients, I had a client yesterday told me COVID you know, with her COVID symptoms, it literally sent her into preterm labor. And she had her baby early just because she was in so much pain and um, very, very sick. Many of them had to be intubated, which means once they, to be intubated to save their life, um, they had to get the baby. So um, the jury is still out on how COVID is affecting nutrition and our life. And there was another question, Simone, about fish. Fish. Does it have an adverse effect on pregnancy? With fish, the concern is um, most fish has, have mercury. So our guidance is to avoid large species of fish, fish like mahi-mahi, um, other species that have a lot of mercury that can cause birth defects. Most of your common fish, salmon, shrimp, crab, tilapia, as long as you're not eating more, eating it more than twice a week, um, you know, or 12 ounces a week, you should be fine on fish. I encourage it because it's quite nutritious. I think this one might be for Chris. It says, are home visits still occurring during COVID? Home visits are still occurring during COVID. Um, we did transition for a period of time to virtual only, but we are transitioning back into full-time face-to-face where the client will meet us, whether that's in the home, in a park, someplace outdoors where we can social distance. But yes, we are doing home visits. That's so wonderful to hear. I'll be sharing that with my, with my own clients. We had another comment that Healthy Families is also another home visiting program. And you have a lot of thank yous, wonderful information, great presentation. Um, Thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Again, this is something you can tell I get so excited about talking about pregnancy and nutrition and things like that. So it's something so near and dear to my heart. I'm so grateful for the invitation. And I'm so glad you guys took some time to spend with us to talk about this really, really important topic. You may have to do Wouldn't part two, Chris. Online? I'm sorry. I'm, no, that's okay. I agree. Dr. Close, we may have to consider a part two. Sure. I have no problem. <laughs> you are so welcome, Anjali. Anjali's my other nutritionist. I'm so glad you made it. <laughs> awesome. I see some names that I see on emails. I see Amelia. So good to see you, Dr. Close. Mrs. Ball, I've heard so much about you. Lori, it's so good to see you. Sandy, it's so good to see all these familiar faces. Oh my goodness. So lovely. Oh my gosh, what a great community. Hey, doc, Dr. Harrison. So glad to see you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, 
Katrina just asked if the recording will be available. Absolutely, this recording will be sent out to everybody who registered for the event. Please share it. The recording will reside on our YouTube channel. So please share it. Lots of great information in this preconception lunch and learn. Daikibra, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. You did a yes, wonderful thank job. Thank you. Thank Actually, you, Miss Mary. Good to see you too. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know our time is up, but I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be doing part three of our preconception health lunch and learn on April 1st, when we are going to be talking about preconception health and sexual health and the importance of sexual health for both men and women when it comes to pregnancy outcomes. Um, our presenters for our April 1st lunch and learn are going to be Joseph Ward. Alana Steeple and Dale Harrison. So the flyer for that will be sent out with this recording as well. And thank you all for spending your Friday lunchtime with us. And I hope you all have a fabulous weekend. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.